quote, Every nation is put to shame if one points out such a wonderfully idealized company of philosophers as that of the early Greek masters, Thales, Anaximander, Heraclitus, Parmenides, Anaxagoras, Empedocles, Democritus, and Socrates. All those men are integral, entire, and self-contained, and hewn out of one stone. Severe necessity exists between their thinking and their character. They are not bound by any convention, because at that time, no professional class of philosophers and scholars existed. They all stand before us in magnificent solitude as the only ones who then devoted their life exclusively to knowledge. End quote. Philosophy in the Tragic Age of the Greeks is one of the more obscure texts in Friedrich Nietzsche's corpus. There are many good reasons for this. It is unfinished and ends abruptly. It was never published, and it concerns subject matter that is not as immediately accessible as Nietzsche's more popular writings. You will not find his major concepts in this work, such as the will to power or the critique of metaphysics, except insofar as those ideas appear in the background, in coet, unnamed, not yet fully formed in Nietzsche's thought. In Nietzsche's interpretation of these pre-Platonic philosophers of ancient Greece, we find the starting place for his later philosophical career. The inspiration for many of those great ideas that we mentioned can arguably be found in his exegesis of these extraordinary figures from the Hellenic world from the 6th through the 4th century BC. Nietzsche wrote this essay in the years 1873 and 1874, while he was still an academic studying classical philology at Basel. Notably, he'd already written his Birth of Tragedy by this time, but that book was not intended as a work of philosophy. Admittedly, one of the main criticisms of Birth of Tragedy at the time of its publication was that it departed significantly from philological rigor. Nietzsche lapses into Schopenhauerian philosophy in that book, uh, at other times into adoration for Wagner. But nevertheless, it must be said, Birth of Tragedy is not a work of pure philosophy. That was not Nietzsche's goal in writing it. He did set out to write a text in the field of philology. However, the project in Philosophy in the Tragic Age of the Greeks is somewhat similar to Birth of Tragedy, insofar as in that book Nietzsche had looked to the Greeks as a counterpoint to modern society, used the exploration of their art, the Greek dramatic tragedy, and the values behind it as a means of understanding art itself, and for that matter, understanding valuing itself. Philosophy in the Tragic Age of the Greeks is much the same in this method only that instead of Greek drama, the topic is Greek philosophy. Nietzsche set the question to himself as to how it was that philosophy came to be in the Greek world. But Philosophy in the Tragic Age of the Greeks is a rather different book from Birth of Tragedy in that it is not a work of philology. It comes out of his study of philology, but Nietzsche is really engaging with the philosophical ideas as these figures put them forward. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you already know the phrase pre-Platonic, but if you haven't heard that phrase before or you need a refresher, Nietzsche comes up with this term to replace the label pre-Socratic. Nietzsche's argument is that so Socrates has more in common with these figures, usually called pre-Socratic, than he does with his own student, Plato. The point of this terminology is to include Socrates among these earlier figures, but it is also to divide him from Plato. The main reason for this is that Socrates is one of these single-minded sages, as Nietzsche calls them. Like the other pre-Platonics, uh, he is hewn from a single stone, whereas Plato is a systematizer who borrows from multiple philosophers. Plato's thought and also his character is a mix of multiple types that came before him, rather than an original expression of one coherent spirit, in Nietzsche's view. Quote, As a man, too, Plato mingles the features of the royally secluded, all-sufficing Heraclitus, of the melancholy, compassionate, and legislatory Pythagoras, 
and of the psycho-expert dialectician Socrates. All later philosophers are such hybrid characters. Wherever something one-sided does come into prominence with them, as in the case of the cynics, it is not a type, but a caricature. End quote. Nietzsche argues that when we come into contact with a single-minded philosophy, we are confronted with something which is considered somewhat absurd from the standpoint of our modern world. That which survives over the ages is, whether we like it or not, dependent on the zeitgeist, the movement of the collective mind, and what the multitude considers relevant in a given time and place. Nietzsche suggests, for example, that Schopenhauer's magnum opus, The World as Will and Representation, has been rendered waste paper by the progressive feeling brought about by the scientific revolutions which are in full swing in Nietzsche's time. And anyone with a sense that there is a real progression and development in the course of the phenomenal world would naturally dispense with such a pessimist as Schopenhauer who doesn't believe in progress. This is just one example, and Nietzsche suggests that we accept this state of affairs, like Goethe, who said, quote, Let no one complain about and grumble at things vile and mean. They are the real rulers, however much this be gainsaid. End quote. In other words, the crowd and its zeitgeist is far more powerful than the truth, and philosophy has never been a course of development in which we grasp the truth more and more completely. Nietzsche's acceptance of this very state of affairs is, somewhat ironically, an appeal to the kind of anti-progressive pessimism that Nietzsche just said the mean and vulgar crowd has dispensed with. Nietzsche's saying, this is an eternal, unchanging truth, that what the multitude believes uh, it never has anything to do with the philosopher's search for knowledge, their devotion of their life to knowledge. That is not what will determine what is in vogue. Nietzsche writes, uh, this is in section two of Philosophy in the Tragic Age of the Greeks, quote, A time which suffers from the so-called general education, but has no culture and no unity of style in her life, hardly knows what to do with philosophy, even if the latter were proclaimed by the very genius of truth in the streets and marketplaces. She rather remains at such a time the learned monologue of the solitary rambler, the accidental booty of the individual, the hidden closet secret, or the innocuous chatter between academic senility and childhood. Nobody dare venture to fulfill in himself the law of philosophy. Nobody lives philosophically with that simple manly faith which compelled an ancient, wherever he was, whatever he did, to deport himself as a Stoic when he had once pledged his faith to the Stoa. All modern philosophizing, is limited politically and regulated by the police to learned semblance. Thanks to governments, churches, academies, customs, fashions, and the cowardice of man, it never gets beyond the sigh, if only, or beyond the knowledge, once upon a time there was. Philosophy is without rights. Therefore, modern man, if he were at all courageous and conscientious, ought to condemn her, and perhaps banish her with words similar to those by which Plato banished the tragic poets from his state. End quote. Once again, there's an irony to Nietzsche's musings here. He's tacitly accepting the notion that modernity is anti-philosophical. It would reject such a way of thinking as that of the pre-Platonic philosopher, who is hewn from one stone, uncompromising, a coherent, integral expression of a tyrannical idea. Philosophy has been relegated to the fringes. Modernity regards such an uncompromising attempt at rendering the world in one's own image as absurdity, or insanity, or even dangerous. Philosophy generally has no power over public opinion, over public institutions, and in such an age as our own that we might designate as a public age, philosophy therefore seems destined to perish. Only a facsimile of it uh, remains among the senile academics. The public mind moves according to what is fashionable, and all that we find in philosophy is unfashionable. We could put it like that. And yet, by authoring this very work, Nietzsche is not 
passively accepting this state of affairs. He's in fact setting himself up against it. He's positioning himself as untimely. And it might be justified to call this work a preliminary, untimely meditation. Nietzsche's purpose in writing this work, uh, as he explains in the preface, is that by presenting us with these remarkable figures from antiquity, we might be able to see that, quote, that mode of life, of viewing human affairs at any rate, has existed once and is therefore possible, end quote. Accordingly, when Nietzsche describes this series of thinkers, they are striking both in their difference from us and our modern ways of thinking, and in their difference from the ways of thinking that preceded them, the, th the ways of thinking that were common in their own culture. Each such philosopher is an archetypal figure, a man who stands for one big idea. Whatever other constituent ideas may be included, they are really just further elaborations on the central idea. In this same preface, Nietzsche admits most philosophies are useful only to their creator, and to subsequent generations, they just look like one big mistake. And accordingly, it's easy to dismiss the Preplatonics, as many have throughout history, for, for example, daring to make hypotheses about nature without having first bothered to invent the scientific method. But as Nietzsche would go on to argue in his later works, such as Beyond Good and Evil, we haven't changed all that much, insofar as philosophers are governed by one ruling thought. Philosophy is a confession, a revelation of who one is. The Preplatonics do this, but without any of the adulteration, any of the sophistication of the modern philosopher, who may have, for example, ideas about the dialectic, that the objective truth can be found through this process of logical investigation. In Nietzsche's understanding, the Preplatonics are more artistic in their approach. Their philosophies are a reflection of what is within them. They do not proceed by careful steps, but by great leaps. What each one of them expresses, in other words, is a will, a tendency, a type. In this sense, the only difference between us and them is that this single-mindedness is not obscured by the pretensions of a philosophical system. These men, accordingly, are, quote, strangers to us, end quote. Nietzsche writes that whoever takes any pleasure in learning about extraordinary men, however, will find pleasure in the strange thought of these figures, however erroneous we may find it to be from our modern standpoint. This is because, quote, they all have in them one point which is irrefutable, a personal touch and color, one can use them in order to form a picture of the philosopher, just as from a plant growing in a certain place, one can form conclusions as to the soil. End quote. If we recall Nietzsche's work, uh, Birth of Tragedy, and especially the comments that he appended to that later work in his 1886 preface that he added, Nietzsche indicates that the appearance of philosophy in the Hellenic world is something of a riddle. The theoretical approach to life, represented by Socrates and Plato, it was, this was seen as a complete inversion of the tragic way of life that came before it. Nietzsche argues in Twilight of the Idols that the Athenian noblemen were creatures of instinct who never knew the reason for the things they did and the things they believed, and Socrates' interrogation of them, seeking for such reasons, speaks to the decline of Greek society. The very fact that their values had become questionable, Socrates is a symptom of this. The creation of philosophy seems like an odd thing when we consider the culture of the Hellenic Greeks, who considered such knowledge to be, quote, useless. That was their word for the kind of knowledge that we would class as philosophical because it was not knowledge that one used for any art or craft. It was not knowledge of how to appease the gods, through the sacrificial rites, nor was it knowledge of how to fight or win battles. Philosophical knowledge, knowledge about the truth of the objective world, as we might put it in our own vocabulary, was something the Greeks were suspicious of. The tragic age of the Greeks we could place from roughly 700 BC to around the time when Socrates died, around 399, that was an age defined by the culture of tragedy. Tragedy. 
It was more broadly a period in which the Greek was instructed primarily by art and poetry. The people entrusted with teaching virtue to the Greek citizens to impart the knowledge to them of how to live and how to act, what the gods were like, and so on, were the playwrights and the poets. Later, there was a formalized school that instructed people in rhetoric and oratory. These were called the sophists, and they represented another such cultural institution entrusted with educating the polis. So how was it that this audacious figure called the philosopher could ever arise on Greek soil? How could the man who pursues worthless knowledge carve out a place for his existence in Hellenic society? The daunting challenge of such a prospect speaks all the more strongly to the power of these philosophical ideas, and more importantly, to the power of the imposing character, the will of the figures that expounded them. Nietzsche, in his understanding of the pre-Platonic philosophers, comes to see them as a type classed among the artists. The philosopher creates a new, unified picture of the world, but through means of concepts. He overcomes the mythic, preliminary stage of philosophizing found in the theologies and cosmogonies. He overcomes the sporadic, aphoristic wisdom found in the writing of the poets and the utterances of the oracles. He goes beyond all of the natural sciences by turning his attention to metaphysics. These figures are extraordinary precisely because they create the art of philosophizing in such a resolutely unself-reflective age. An age of unreason, pride, the pitiless pursuit of worldly power. The fact that such philosophers flourished during this age makes their appearance the most noteworthy of all such appearances of philosophers throughout history, throughout the many different civilizations and different epochs of human history. This meditation on the figure of the Greek philosopher can be seen as a prefiguration of Nietzsche's later thoughts on the problem of science. This begins in earnest with Socrates, but seems to have its roots in these earlier figures. Or the role of the philosopher in a healthy society. This is the philosopher presented as a healthy figure rather than a sick figure. The very concern with sickness and health bears resemblance to Nietzsche's mature philosophy in which health and sickness become interchangeable with strength and weakness or with vitality and decline. The core question of philosophy in the tragic age of the Greeks might be put this way. Assuming that most examples we have of philosophers are sick examples, that is to say, they arose during a sick period of civilization. What then is a healthy philosopher? What does the philosopher mean to a healthy society? Accordingly, one alternative title to the work that Nietzsche explored as an option was The Philosopher as Physician to Culture. Nietzsche is not just using the term physician in the sense of a medical doctor, someone that you see just when you're sick. Uh, when the physiology stops working, you go to the doctor. Ironically, one could say that's a sick person's view of medicine. We might consider Nietzsche's remark in his lecture on Pythagoras that, quote, the theory and practice of the physicians were considered further advancement for gymnastic trainers, end quote. The physician was seen more like a craftsman who worked on and perfected the physique. He didn't just fix it when it was broken. The physician's research, his knowledge, furthered the art of the personal trainers who produced Olympic athletes. The Greeks had made an entire social institution out of creating the ideal physique, and the knowledge of the physician was used for this purpose. And thus, even though Nietzsche didn't ultimately uh, end up using this title, again, he, he didn't even publish the essay, we can still see the parallel there. The philosopher is a physician to culture, meaning that in a healthy time, the philosopher is not just the person who fixes culture when it's broken. The philosopher is the one who acquires the knowledge of what cultural health itself constitutes and thus brings a healthy culture into greater and greater health. Nietzsche writes at the beginning of this essay, quote, Whenever philosophy showed itself helping, saving, prophylactic. It was with healthy people. It made sick people still more ill. <laughs>
if ever a nation was disintegrated and but loosely connected with the individuals, never has philosophy bound these individuals closer to the whole. If ever an individual was willing to stand aside and plant around himself the hedge of self-sufficiency, philosophy was always ready to isolate him still more and to destroy him through isolation. She is dangerous where she is not in her full right, and it is only the health of a nation, but not that of every nation, which gives her this right. Let us now look around for the highest authority as to what constitutes the health of a nation. The Greeks, as the truly healthy nation, have justified philosophy once and for all by having philosophized, and that indeed more than all other nations. End quote. Nietzsche abandoned this essay in order to focus his efforts on a new project, critiquing David Strauss. This would become the first untimely meditation, and Nietzsche would write and publish three more of them. These are usually considered his first purely philosophical works. But had Nietzsche finished this essay instead, philosophy in the tragic age of the Greeks likely would have been the first. And therefore, I tend to see this work as Nietzsche's first foray into philosophy, his first purely philosophical essay. As to why he did not finish it, there's a number of possibilities that we won't go into here. Uh, they mostly involve speculation. Um, I guess the short version that we could say is that Nietzsche may have wished to take on subject matter that was entirely outside of his scholarly career as a philologist, so maybe he wanted to leave the Greeks behind as a primary subject. He might have wanted to impress the Wagners by attacking David Strauss, a figure for whom they bore some dislike. Whatever the case may be, this essay unfortunately ends after a discussion of the philosopher Anaxagoras, and it thus leaves out the final three figures that he mentions, Democritus, Empedocles, and Socrates. Thankfully, we have Nietzsche's lectures on the pre-Platonic philosophers, the text of which has been assembled, translated, and published in what seems to have been a daunting undertaking all its own. Those lectures contain many of the same ideas and descriptions as appear in this essay, and philosophy in the tragic age of the Greeks is clearly based at least in part on those lectures. Even some of the phrasing remains the same from the lecture notes to the essay. Nietzsche's focus is a bit different in the lectures, though. For one, the lectures are primarily concerned with a narrative about the emergence of scientific materialism. Nietzsche argues that this process, as it develops in Hellenic civilization, is mirrored in European Enlightenment civilization. Nietzsche draws parallels between the scientific minds of modern Europe and the pre-Platonics, and he elucidates the thought of the pre-Platonics by comparison with scientific experiments and new theories in physics. That is, new for Nietzsche's time. I have, in the past, called the book that Nietzsche had originally planned, based on these lectures, the most important book that Nietzsche never wrote. Because so many of the underpinnings of his later ideas are in the background of those lectures. You see how he's in dialogue with the Greek philosophers, how his philosophy is in many ways a response to them. And there is a surprising importance to the philosophy of science, which is a large part of this. If you want to know more about that aspect of Nietzsche's interpretation of the pre-Platonics, I recommend you listen to the episodes from season two about that topic entitled Descent into Materialism and the World as Will to Power and Nothing Besides. Those episodes primarily cover the pre-Platonic lectures, which should be regarded as essentially another iteration of the same project of Nietzsche's, albeit approached from a slightly different angle. Today, instead, we're going to focus on the incarnation of those ideas in the form of this essay, Philosophy in the Tragic Age of the Greeks, in which his engagement with the pre-Platonics is a bit more straightforward philosophical. The meta-narrative concerning the development of science it is still there, but it's more in the background, and Nietzsche's focus is primarily on representing this sequence of fascinating personalities to us. Nevertheless, since the essay is unfinished, and I do want to cover the final names that he planned to include here, we'll look to his lecture notes to fill out the descriptions of the final figures Empedocles and Democritus. I'm not going to devote a section to Socrates here. This is not because Socrates is unimportant, 
but because we've already spent numerous episodes discussing Nietzsche's interpretation of Socrates. Nietzsche on Socrates would require an episode all its own, which we've already done, so including such a discussion here would not do the subject justice, and it would also be redundant. It should also be said that Nietzsche's lecture notes concern many other figures that we will not discuss. We're going to strictly concern ourselves with the names that Nietzsche lists off at the beginning of the essay. Nietzsche, I think correctly, judges those that he excludes from this essay to be merely secondary figures. There are either elaborators within the school of someone else, or significant only as the forerunner of someone else. So that uh, we can help make sense of this procession of figures, and remember how they fit in with one another, I'd like to begin by breaking the pre-Platonics down into categories or phases of pre-Platonic thought. Thales, Anaximander, and Heraclitus are what I would call the first cosmologists. Their primary concern is with understanding the material world and explaining the material world. They have a monistic tendency, and they believe in arising and passing away. That is to say that things come into and go out of being. These are the three figures that we're going to talk about in this first episode. Then there are the Eleatics. The sole figure who represents them here is Parmenides. The Eleatics believe that non-being doesn't exist, that things don't arise and pass away, and that only being exists. Therefore, change is impossible, motion is impossible, and the senses are illusory. Finally, there are the pluralists, Anaxagoras, Empedocles, and Democritus, who believe not in being, but beings, plural. Multiple existence, multiple types of matter that interact and transform. The pluralists are concerned with explaining the basic principles of these interactions and transformations. So, the first cosmologists, the Iliadics, and the pluralists are the major categorizations of thought here. You could categorize them according to a different schema. These are simply my arbitrary distinctions that we're making here for the purposes of helping to better remember how these thinkers interact and relate to one another. They're not essential designations, it's just a helpful mnemonic. And so without further ado, I'll attempt to fulfill Nietzsche's purposes in this project, albeit in podcast form, of giving you a portrait of each of these significant pre-Platonic figures. We'll begin with Thales. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. Or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.